Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and Avengers Infinity War left us with infinite heartbreak. Both its ending and its hero. <laughs> Even after the countless times I have Doctor Strange through this thing, this Infinity Saga rewatch has turned up a whole bunch of new stuff that I somehow missed. So let's get started with a new breakdown of this movie with the opening words. Thor director Kenneth Branagh cameos as this voice. And if you think about it, this film actually bookends with the distress call from another director, director Nick Fury. Well done. Half the Asgardians did escape this attack, including Valkyrie, Korg, and Meek, who we know arrived at New Asgard in Endgame. But you can actually see them fleeing here in the Grandmaster's pleasure craft from Thor Ragnarok. Thanos preaches. I know what it's like to lose. Feel so desperately that you're right. Yet to fail, nonetheless. Turns the legs to jelly. You talk too much. At 29 minutes, Thanos has the most screen time of any character in this film. Thor, by comparison, has only half that, 14 and a half minutes. The framing here reflects that disparity, with the Avengers so small and defeated that we initially don't even recognize him at Thanos' feet. The writers framed Thanos as the true protagonist of this story. It's his journey, making Thor structurally his antagonist. Like had Thor gone for the head, he'd be the hero of Infinity War. Instead, he's this movie's crazy axe murderer. Also, that idea of failure to turning the legs to jelly, Dark and Cap wobble off their feet at the end of this movie, and when Thanos fails in Endgame, he's all jelly too. Loki calls back Tony in Avengers. We have a Hulk. We have a Hulk. Thanos defeats Hulk, deliberately not using the Power Stone. It's the last we're seeing of Conqueror Thanos. He now removes his armor, retiring to a spiritual quest. Josh Brolin based his performance on Marlon Brando in Apocalypse Now. Both of them delusional baldies. Actually, stubble is visible on Thanos' head, suggesting that, like Brando, he shaves it out of similar dogmatic commitment. Ebony Ma says, My humble personage bows before your grandeur. Yeah, we get it, he's a f boss. But he's actually directly quoting Mephisto, Thanos' right-hand demon in the Infinity Gauntlet comics. He has yet to make an appearance in the MCU other than a barely readable line back in Avengers. Loki's death is preceded with his memory of Odin's recent death in acknowledgement of him as a son. My sons, I've been waiting for you. I, Loki, Prince of Asgard, Odin's son. He even turns to the left with the same framing and expression. He'll never turn again because his, you know, his neck did this. Until he shows up in a different timeline in Loki, thanks to the time heist, with the same thing that he just died for. I used to think Infinity War was a story of sacrifice, and to be fair, it is. We don't trade lives. But on a deeper level, Loki and Heimdall's shocking early deaths here establish this as a movie about mourning. How do we accept the deaths of loved ones? What kind of monster would think that watching a loved one die would make things better in any way? Well, Thanos, that's who. Now, Thanos is a psycho Malthusian eco-terrorist, and he's wrong on so many levels. But the Avengers' stubborn refusal to let any of them die ever? That's naive. So yeah, in this movie, they're taught a brutal lesson in triage. Sometimes you just gotta let go so that we can all move forward. That's not evil, that's just like human existence. It's an awesome dark lesson to which the Avengers say, mm, yeah, but what about using Captain Marvel and Quantum Realm bullshit? an end game. Actually, Tommy and I will answer all your Quantum Realm questions in the next episode of The Big Question. Check it out. Now, Hulk's Bifrost trajectory takes him past the sun first, then past the moon to Earth. There's a Redditor who charted this out to propose that there was a solar eclipse at this moment, which ancient Norse peoples interpreted as a sign of the coming Ragnarok apocalypse. And had this diagram paste the eclipse over Norway, as it would need to be for that prophecy to be true, Hulk's vector would have landed him on the eastern seaboard. So maybe Maybe there's something to this. Banner, of course, lands in the Sanctum with his warning, as Silver Surfer does in the comics. Who notes the Cloak of Levitation wraps around Strange. Later, Banner appears to be wearing some of Strange's casual clothes. Poor guy always just needs to borrow some clothes. Tony tells Pepper about his vivid dream of their kid named Morgan, a dream that comes true in Endgame, but only after his haunting nightmare of Earth's doom from Age of Ultron comes to pass. 
Tony bickers with Strange. Did you seriously just say hitherto undreamt of? Are you seriously leaning on the cauldron of the cosmos? Is that what that is? In the comics, Strange uses the cauldron of the cosmos to help Spider-Man look backwards in time, as Strange's cryptic one plan will require the Avengers to do. They mention making balloon animals, which is a nod to Doctor Strange's Jimmy Kimmel bit, also Ben and Jerry's ice cream flavor, a hunk of Hulk of Burning Fudge, which Banner eats in Endgame. Tony pulls out the old flip phone cap FedEx to Tony Stank in Civil War. That 2011 AT&T Z221's envelope icon means that there is an unopened text here, indicating that Cap must have texted Tony something on this phone that he never read. Wouldn't have been another text and no one else had this number. Maybe it was a check-in on Vision, since Cap and his crew was tailing him to keep an eye on him. Peter Parker's spidey sense triggers his arm hairs, just like the tiny hairs real-life spiders use to sense vibrations. Sorry if that spider scared you. He takes off from Stan Lee's school bus, wearing a shirt reading, Lettuce, the Taste of Sadness, and he'll get a big mouthful of lettuce as this movie ends. Tony's new Mark 50 nanotech armor absorbs his sunglasses as he takes them off, meaning that they could have just absorbed it around his face. He just took them off as an intimidation tactic. Ebony Maw burns his hand on the Eye of Agamotto, just like that Raiders Nazi with the headpiece. And when Wong severs Cole Obsidian's hand, on the other side of that portal, Bruce Banner had his fists up, ready to go. Tony shoots up to save Peter. Inside Tony's helmet, you can see his nanotech preparing to assemble into that foot booster. Later on in Titan, the HUD does the same thing. You can see the nanobots prepping into the missiles that he's about to fire at Thanos. But here, this foot booster was an upgrade after Tony's failure to catch up to Rhodey in Civil War. Boom. <laughs> Never forget. The Guardians of the Galaxy sing along to Rubber Band Man, a song written for the Spinner's producer's son to cheer him up for being teased about his weight. And if you think about it, this song would be on Yondu's Zune. And in the next scene, Quill gets fat shamed. So this is his real daddy cheering up the fat kid who to him was always small and good for thieving. Mantis, by the way, is always hilarious to watch in the background of these movies. After Peter tells them to put on their mean faces, you can see her practicing gnashing her teeth for several minutes. And later on in Nowhere, she creeps in with her hands and fingers folded downward like a praying mantis. When Thor grabs Gamora's shoulder, she reaches for her sword instinctively. That sword's God Slayer, by the way, to slay this god if she needs to, however she wants to. Wanda scans Vision's Mind Stone, visually foreshadowing the way she'll blast this thing out of his head later. I just feel you. That line also foreshadowing Vision's final words to her. I just feel you. Cap saves him. Now he has torn off the star emblem from his suit because he's now a man without a country, the nomad version of himself. Well, not exactly, but you get it. And through the tears on his suit underneath, Cap is still wearing older scale armor. Natasha has gone blonde and wears his gray vest, the same one that Yelena Belova is wearing in footage for the upcoming Black Widow. So I think we can assume it'll shed light on Nat's two year period between Civil War and now, and why she probably killed her friend and took her top and her hair color. In nowhere, one of the collections in the background is a blue man, a nod by the Russos to their work on Arrested Development. It's also worth noting that this intact version of the vault is actually a reality stone illusion, Michael. So Thanos conjured this blue man from his own imagination. And another reality stone clue that fans spotted a couple years ago when the Blu-ray came out. When Gamora stabs Thanos and pulls a dagger back, that dagger doesn't have any of Thanos' blood on it. Illusions. Back at Avengers HQ, Stephen McFeely, co-writer of the movie, cameos as one of Secretary Ross's aides, and Vision makes his most useful contribution to the MCU. Thanos threatens half the universe. One life cannot stand in the way of defeating him. But it should. We don't trade lives, Vision. Yes, the Avengers could have just skipped ahead to Vision's fate, ripping out that USB drive without exporting it, but their stubbornness to, like, surgically go around and try to sustain his soul gives Thanos just enough time to get the Time Stone and then reverse all this. Their refusal to trade lives costs everyone everything, and it will force them to trade lives nonetheless and to mourn. Ebony Ma tortures Doctor Strange. They were originally designed for microsurgery. A cruel irony for Strange, whose pre-sorcerer days were spent doing microsurgery like this. And recently, the writers revealed an alternate version of the scene where Tony saves Strange by putting him in the Mark 50 nanotech armor. Strange tells him, If it comes to saving you, or the kid, or the Time Stone, 
I will not hesitate to let either of you die. Yeah, finally, someone is speaking some sense. The other Avengers' losses of loved ones and mentors felt like avoidable mistakes to them. Every battle since, they've been trying to fix what they thought they did wrong. But Strange lost the Ancient One, and she taught him that death gives life meaning. So yeah, Strange is totally willing to sacrifice others, also sacrifice the Time Stone itself, because he knows it could lead to a winning endgame. Ah, Rewatching a great movie like this makes me appreciate the filmmaking process and its impact on great attention to detail. And now is a better time than ever to take a class and learn more about this craft, which you can do with Skillshare. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers membership with meaning, so much to explore, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creatives. Skillshare empowers you to accomplish real growth. Skillshare offers classes designed for real life. You can learn and grow with short classes that fit any schedule. Skillshare lets you explore classes that may help you express what you're feeling inside right now with creative self-discovery. Taking a creative writing class or a painting class, a Photoshop class, those can help you break up the routine, especially if you're spending a lot of your time indoors. They have classes and topics new Rockstars fans will enjoy, like animation, film, video, music production. The class that I checked out that I really liked is Teach Yourself to Draw Anything, a step-by-step -step process, taught by Hayden Aub. The class focuses on building a routine of drawing so that you can improve your skills over time. I am now the best drawer of all time of stick figures, but I'm getting there. Skillshare is curated specifically for learning. There's no ads and they're always launching new premium classes so that you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. And it's less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a two month free trial of premium membership so that you can explore your creativity with Skillshare. Thanos uses both the Power Stone and the Space Stone to separate Nebula's parts and torture each part of her, which would be double the amount of pain that he gave Thor with just the Power Stone earlier. And he tells Gamora. But I never taught you to lie. That's why you're so bad at it. Yes, in Guardians Volume 2, Nebula also was unable to lie. You know, you'd think an evil supervillain would learn how to properly lie. And in Endgame, she echoes Thanos' whole lying policy. My father has many things. A liar is not one of them. Thor, Rocket, and Groot find the ruins of Nidavellir and Eitri, who forged the Infinity Gauntlet with a mold. The screenwriters recently interpreted that the gauntlet Thanos had in the Age of Ultron post credit scene was a practice gauntlet. And thank God, because that clears up, actually it makes things a lot more confusing, because now we have four gauntlets, but they assemble a new weapon. In theory, it could even summon the Bifrost. Does it have a name? Stormbreaker. Stormbreaker is the name of the battle axe Beta Ray Bill carries during his time as Thor. And yes, it does have Bifrost powers. You can notice how this mold is engraved with the symbol of the Bifrost that it scorches into the ground. Strange cushions the crash landing for Tony and Peter. Oh, you won. Yes, one that Tony will give Strange. The one out of 14,605 futures that they succeed in. And the one sacrifice play that Strange reminds him of in the endgame. And he always trembles his hand. He also does it here when confronting the Guardians, and when surrendering the Time Stone, which I pointed out in the Doctor Strange breakdown, is some really solid acting continuity by Benedict Cumberbatch since his hands were never fully healed. The gravity on Titan is reduced, Mantis bounces, and Drax yawns, which might not just be because he's bored, but because reduced gravity makes the air thinner, resulting in yawning to get more oxygen. Yeah, you just yawned, didn't you? I'm in your head. Thanos and Gamora encounter Red Skull. Welcome, Thanos. Son of Alos, Gamora. Daughter of Thanos. Thanos puts his hand back to keep Gamora behind him, a protective instinct, setting up his coming sacrifice of her as even more heartbreaking. Also, the fact that Red Skull identified her as daughter of Thanos, despite him not being her real father, he kidnapped her. But it means that he was still the truest paternal figure to her soul. Thanos' father was Alars, an Eternal. Rumor has it the upcoming Eternals film might show us a young Thanos, and maybe that history will be explored further. Now, during this whole sequence, Thanos carries Gamora's all things balance dagger in his belt. We only realize it when she snatches it to try to kill herself, but it's another bubbles reality stone illusion, meaning he kept it there as a trick to keep Gamora on the line, thinking she had a fail safe to take her own life if she had to. It's one final lesson, using this dagger as a symbol for his whole dark balance philosophy. And I love how Thanos' true love tear trickles right into the trench on his cheek, as if this guy was designed, naturally selected, to be the universe's top mourner. T'Challa tells the Black Order, Thanos would have nothing but dust and blood. Yeah, solid foreshadowing, Thanos does get his dust and the blood of those he left wounded. And again, that victory comes from Thanos' willingness to trade lives. 
are killing themselves. Natasha's concerned look signals her dread. She gets it. We don't trade lives, but they do. They're gonna win. The Wakandans chant. We both back. We both back. The war cry that translates to hold or hold fast. And we actually heard this first in Black Panther. We both back. We both back. It's the River Tribe's call. T'Challa is saluting and paying respects to his love, Nakia. T'Challa and Cap lead the charge. They both have enhanced speed, but T'Challa is a step ahead. The last time they sprinted in a scene together, one was chasing the other in Civil War. Now they run together side by side, Cap on his left. Itri smashes the Stormbreaker mold, meaning this weapon could never be forged again. Now this Molten Uru also appears to flow into a second forge, which at first I thought was for the back half of the hammer, but you can see both pieces are beside each other in that one mold. Maybe it's the missing handle, but you know, that would be a weird thing to also make out of Uru. I'm just pointing out, Itri might be using the company printer ink for personal projects. Along the bladed edge of Stormbreaker, Asgardian runes translate to loose the dogs of war. A famous paraphrase from Julius Caesar, cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. Groot winces as his branches singe and he cuts off his arm for the handle. So Groot, like Strange, gets that personal sacrifice is key to victory. And now anytime Thor swings Stormbreaker, Groot will be by his side. The three ride the Bifrost to Wakanda, rallying the others. Notice Rhodey's War Machine armor is now marked four, an upgrade after his mark three, well, you know. On Titan, Thanos begins to use the stones in interesting combinations. So he uses the Power Stone to blast through Tony's debris, and then the Reality Stone to turn it into bats. And then he combines the Power Stone and the Space Stone to harness fire from Tony's explosives, and then redirect it as a flamethrower. He stops Quill, Drax, and Nebula with the Power Stone, but when we cut back to him, his Soul Stone is weirdly glowing. Maybe he spared Gamora's soul here? I don't see why he'd want to do that. Or maybe he needed to combine with the Soul Stone, since Quill is a half-celestial. Quill uses his Gravity Snare on Thanos, the same device he used to hook the Power Stone Orb in Guardians Volume 1, using it again here to regain stone possession. But thanks to Quill, they fail. And Thanos uses another stone combination, the Power Stone, to smash up a nearby moon into chunks, and then the Space Stone to spike all the chunks down at him. We cut back to Wakanda, Rocket again shows his obsession with spare body parts. Okay, how much for the arm? And Banner uses his handy Hulkbuster arm to clamp on a Call Obsidian stump from his severed arm earlier, blasting him off to his death. And Vision also comes full circle in his killing of Corvus Glaive, surprise impaling him with the same weapon and attack he used on him back in Edinburgh. Now the writers said that they based Thanos and Strange's wizard duel on the Vincent Price Boris Karloff duel in the Raven. Strange tries to trap Thanos on the mirror dimension. Thanos turns it into a black hole. Strange turns that into butterflies, a sweeter version of the Thanos bat spell earlier. The writers also revealed that Strange was originally going to drag Thanos into a vision of the bones of his victims in a trial with the Living Tribunal judging him guilty. Strange uses his Images of Icon spell from the comics, but Thanos uses the Soul Stone again to identify which Strange was the real one. Tony and Thanos' fight echoes Tony's past foes in reverse order, so he has a thruster-powered hook, like his shotgun armor against Killian in Iron Man 3. This cuts Thanos. All that for a drop of blood. Echoing Iron Man 2 with Flash's line. If you can make God bleed, then people will cease to believe in him. And after stabbing Tony, Baldy tilts over paralyzed Tony, just like Baldy Obadiah Stane did in the first Iron Man. And Wakanda Cap briefly holds back Thanos. Roland includes a subtle look of surprise and respect. Thor, blinded by vengeance, surrenders the hero title to Thanos because victory would have been his if he just aimed a little higher. You should have gone for the head. <laughs> I love Thor's no! Like any crazy antagonist in a movie, the moment they get defeated. Thanos portals away, and a couple years back, I pointed out how you could see a green glow on that wound, suggesting he might be using the Time Stone to reverse the injury. But rewatching it, there's also some red in there to suggest that he could be using the Reality Stone to also warp the wound. Really, all the stones are glowing, and you can see all six of those colors in the wound, suggesting that it takes all six stones combined to shake out Stormbreaker and the dusting begins. The VFX artist settled on desaturated dust to connect with the spiritual ashes to ashes, dust to dust concept, but also to make it easy for the particles to blend in and disappear in the background. So it's not just like clumps and piles of ash, it's dust scattered amongst the soil and gone. James Gunn later tweeted that Groot's final I am Groot to Rocket translates to 
dad. Wanda throws her head back in anguish, her last thoughts being her murdered love. On Titan, Dave Bautista delivers this heartbreakingly high-pitched quill as his final word. <gasps> and Peter's spidey sense gets one last devastating use, sensing the oncoming pain. Is it start? I don't feel so good. Afterward, Tony looks at his hand and he holds it to his face, as if trying to embrace that dust that just slipped through his fingers. On his garden farm, Thanos watches the sun rise, just as he promised earlier. And then what? I finally rest and watch the sun rise on a grateful universe. A god resting on the seventh day. In the corner, his armor hangs as a scarecrow, just like Farmer Thanos in the comics. Everyone ends this movie on their butts. The Avengers feel the sting of the lives they fought so hard to never have to trade, but now, nevertheless, dead in their hands. But Thanos also feels that pain of sacrifice. What did it cost? Everything. But he wins because he faces the morning. Join our next MCU watch along on Discord by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash new rockstars. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EA Voss. Follow new rockstars and uh, hit that subscribe button because shrunken little boy Scott Lang can't reach it. <laughs>